Good afternoon. Oh, I got a nice response. I do want to thank you all for coming. Thank you, friends on Zoom, for viewing. Um, you know, we try real hard to provide content at these seminars that y'all care about. Obviously, from today's turnout, you guys have a heart for legacy and making an impact on your children, your children's children, the world at large. You know, but how do we do that? Because you might have, I mean, it's just hard to know who, how, where, you know, you might not have all the resources to do everything that you want to do. Um, and that's what we're here for tonight or today. <laughs> not evening. I'm used to an evening seminar. Um, I saw a movie once where one fellow said to the other, you don't have the guts to lay your body on the barbed wire and let your team crawl over. And the other fellow says, you know, I think I just snipped the wire. So today, James Lenhoff and Jake Samad, who is one of our um, estate attorney referral partners, will be sharing with us some ways that we can have both and and not just either or. So please welcome James and Jake. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's very kind of you. One small housekeeping. I do need to refer to our disclaimer slide. My lovely assistant, thank you. Um, just to let you know that this is not an official advising session. Also, they may be asking for some audience participation and uh, myself or Corey will come around with microphones. Please ask your questions or make your comments into the mic so our friends on Zoom can hear. Thank you. Hey, I am so excited to be here with you guys. Uh, I think my mic is not on mute this time, so the people on Zoom can actually hear me. That was last time's problem. Yeah, no, I'm green. I'm good. All right, good. Hey, if I have not had a chance to meet you yet, my name is James Lenhoff, and I am the director of mission here at WealthQuest, which probably sounds a little bit like a cushy job, and it actually probably is, if I'm honest. So uh, I was part of the team that helped start this place, and what I'm finding as we continue to get bigger and bigger is what I'm passionate about is making sure we stay on mission. Our mission here at WealthQuest is that we exist to empower families to live meaningful lives. And there is nothing more meaningful, in my opinion, than making sure that what we're creating is a legacy of impact and making sure that what we're leaving behind, the thumbprint that we're leaving on the generations that follow and the causes that we care about align with what our heart is telling us is important. And so I'm super excited that there's this many people here today and all the people on Zoom. Uh, I had no idea that there'd be this much energy about talking about your own demise. So, <laughs> man, like we've tried all kinds of other topics that seemed a whole lot more positive, but turns out everybody wants to talk about dying, I guess. I didn't know. Uh, so, Jake, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the format and we'll go from there. So, so I'm Jake Samad. I'm a partner at the firm Robbins, Kelly, Patterson, and Tucker, or a mid-sized firm here in the city. Uh, I focus my practice in the areas of estate planning and trust and estate administration. I advise people uh, who own closely held businesses, real estate, uh, about how they can effectuate a lot of that meaningful planning that James has alluded to. So uh, that's what I do during the day. I like to talk about death and taxes because that's how I earn a living. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you have to listen to me talk about it. But, uh, no, I live in College Hill with my wife, Amy, my two kids, Jack and Audrey. I'm um, happy to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. That's awesome. Yeah, and Jake and I have known each other for, we think, a little over 12 years, yeah. maybe a little longer than that. Uh, the thing that I will say, and you even heard it already, uh, Jake is going to speak every now and then in legalese. He's going to yeah. say things like effectuate. Yes, right? that's right. That's right. And my job, because this man, what's that? You're translating. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, 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 I'm going to take right. legalese and yeah, turn that's it into right. English. That's right. That's right. Uh, this, I, I can speak from experience on the number of cases he and I have worked together on. There's an incredible brilliance in this man in terms of how to understand all these things. And one of the reasons why Jake is so good at what he does is because he actually has walked through the same crazy transitions that I walked through in terms of what's happened. When we started in the business, you know, if you had an estate that was over $350,000, you were subject to the Ohio estate tax. And there was so much rigmarole we had to do. And then all that disappeared. And so Jake was in the business when all that craziness was there. And so there's a whole level of understanding of where we've been, not just where we are, that actually informs a lot of where we're going. And so um, my job is to try to pull out of his brain that brilliance today and then protect you from the legalese and try to translate. That's, and I'm probably going to fail. But I'm well, I feel like that was just a really polite way to call me old. Is what you yeah, just said there. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's you right. just said, that's hey, right. you're, yeah. getting, you're getting old. Um, <laughs> 
So here's how this is going to work. We intentionally did not put together a bunch of slides and a big old presentation. We don't want this to be a lecture. We want it to be a conversation. So we're going to talk through a couple of different <coughs> ideas and ways that we can think about some of the impacts we can make. Jake's going to explain what that looks like. And then I invite all of you to stop us, ask questions in the middle of it. We want this to be a big dialogue, not a monologue from up here, because we want you to walk away with, question, with the answers to the questions that you're walking in with. Mm -hmm. This is not estate planning 101. This is not what is a trust, what is a will. We're assuming all of you already have all that stuff. We're moving to estate planning 301, maybe even a little bit of 401. We're gonna dabble in some more advanced ideas. And so understand that we're gonna dabble. These topics can go super deep and I would invite you if there's something that kind of grabs your attention to talk to your advisor here at WealthQuest, uh, talk to Jake. We need to get deeper into the weeds for you to fully understand how it might impact you. But today we're just trying to at least give you awareness of all the options and how they work, okay? So uh, if Jake starts to go down too deep of a path and starts using language that's more Latin than English, I'm gonna stop him <laughs> and we're gonna back up. Um, I can say per stirpes though, right? Per stirpes is okay, but that's about as far as you can go. Yeah. Fair, fair. <laughs> um, it's good to know. Yes, so we're gonna talk about legacy and you guys are all here to talk about that, which I'm super excited about. But before we talk about what happens after you die, what I want to call our attention to is whatever you're thinking you want your legacy to be at death or after death, you need to start that now while you're alive. Your legacy is not just what you leave behind. It's what you're doing today with those that you care about, the causes you're invested in. And the legacy, we need to be thinking of it as the continuation of that, not the beginning of it. Too often, I'll talk to clients and they'll say things like, man, when I'm gone, I really want my kids and my grandkids to invest in shared experiences. I want them to go on trips. I'm like, are you doing that now? Well, no, then they're not gonna do that. They're not gonna be able to connect to it. You haven't modeled it for them. You haven't shown them that it matters. And so we gotta start now doing those things. And the things that we're doing then can be continued after we're gone. And that's how you actually build an effective legacy. So as we're talking about the transition, I wanna always have you paying attention to the fact that Whatever you're wanting to do after the fact that you pass really needs to start today if it's not there already, because it will not carry forward. If one of your goals or, or heart cries is that your kids or grandkids connect to generosity, but they've never been modeled what it looks like to connect to causes they care about, you can leave a bunch of money to a charitable fund and they're like, well, why did they do that? They just totally cheated me out of all this inheritance because they don't have the same heart. So we got to build that in while we're alive and impart that to them before we're gone. So. That's my little soapbox, I'll get off. Uh, here's the deal, when we think about the estate design, it can really only benefit four different entities or places, I guess is a good way to think of it. We can really only send these resources four different <clears throat> directions. Your kids, so think of that as first generation, maybe it's nieces and nephews, but it's that next level down from you. Then it's the following generation, grandkids, right? So you have your kids, your grandkids, or your nieces and nephews, and your great nieces and nephews, right? We can move down that next level. The third area is we can benefit charity. We can give money to causes that we care about. And then the last place it goes is the government. And those really are the only four places it can go. So it's ironically, we complicate all of this and the structures are super complex, but the bottom line is it's pretty simple. There's only four places this goes, which four, which of those four matter the most? And which ones are we trying to actually cut out of the deal? Clearly, the government is one we're trying to cut out as often as possible. But what happens a lot of times is we believe that these are either or decisions. I can either send this to my kids or I can send it to charity. I can either have this benefit my grandkids or I can have it benefit the government, right? All of these seem like they're either or directions. And the truth is most of them are both and. When we add layers of complexity, we can actually accomplish two things at once. And so what I want to talk about is each of those four areas. We're just going to kind of, Jake and I are going to, you know, have a little banter. discussion. Yeah, yes. banter. Let's, yeah. We're going to banter back and forth. Is there a James. legal verb or legal word for banter? We're going to pontificate. Ooh, there it is. See, he's doing it already. Dang it. That's he's doing it do. already. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, they're yeah, not the that's same. That's right. They're probably not. Not really what we're going to be right. doing, but it was a big word I could think of. So we're just going to take those ahead. four areas and we're going to talk about how we can impact them and how we can think about ways to layer in other goals that might impact two or three at once. So let's start with kids. Mm -hmm. 
as we think about that next generation down, there's a couple of things we can do that are relatively straightforward that matter. And yep. then there's some more advanced stuff. So yeah. So, I mean, when we think about what happens with our assets, James already mentioned, we're not going to talk about the simple stuff. We're going to talk, we're going to assume that we've already thought about avoiding probate, thought about how to efficiently transition assets to your kids. Um, but then we got to think about how they're going to actually receive those assets, right? And what's going to actually happen. Simple things are putting in what we call age gates, saying things like, when they turn 25, they're going to be able to withdraw up to a third of their share, maybe up to two thirds at 30 and the rest at 35. Right? That's a pretty common uh, distribution plan where you kind of set out multiple options for your kids to be able to take things out over time. But then you can get into more complex uh, distribution plans where maybe you hold the shares for your kids entire lifetime. And so you create a share that is held for your children's benefit or your uh, nieces and nephews or whoever. Uh, during their lifetime, and you dictate in the document how you're going to distribute those assets over your kid's lifetime. So maybe it's an income stream. Maybe they get only the income that's generated by uh, that the, the trust principal. Uh, maybe it's a percentage. You, know, you say they get 10% a year until they reach some age, and then at that age, they get the rest of it. What are you ultimately doing there? What, well, the idea is that you're protecting those assets from you know, potential creditors, maybe divorcing spouse, those sorts of things for your kid's benefit. But also you're instilling in your kids kind of your last uh, ditch effort of how they should be managing things appropriately over time, right? We don't want to just drop a bunch of money in their laps necessarily. Um, we want to be more intentional about how we think through those distributions and how they might happen. Yeah, I would jump in real quick and add that uh, those are the kinds of things that should change over time as you watch your kids age. Mm -hmm. So as you get to a point where you can see they're trustworthy, That's right. but I'm noticing that they don't ever go anywhere. They work too hard. Great example. You can add in those provisions some specific instructions. I had, I'm going to be the storyteller. I'm the color commentary guy. Yeah. Jake is the play by play. By play. play. Yeah. Um, I had a client, we had a, we had a client who uh, had inherited resources uh, from their, I want to say uncle. And the deal was, if you use this distribution, you get $24,000 a year to be used to go on a trip, go and do something amazing. And if you don't, it goes to charity. Right. So it was an incentive that was beyond just, hey, you get some money. It was a, I want you to do something specific that will be for you. And if you don't, you lose it, right? And so it put a little bit of teeth behind it. And these people, they went to the Galapagos. They, I mean, they did amazing trips because they were incentivized. And so they're, whoever, I can't remember if it was the uncle or what the story was, but whoever that person was saw in them this need to go do adventure and in, embedded in their trust, the instruction to make that happen. So that's, that's the kind of stuff we can add beyond just age gates. Yeah, and there really, we can be really intentional, but we have to be really intentional. So if we're going to explore options like that, we have to make sure that we're incentivizing the right thing. So sometimes you'll see things like, you know, if you get married, we'll distribute $20,000. Well, I have a client, in fact who's been married now four times. Wait, 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 you're doing the color commentary now. Well, sorry, yeah. You're right. <laughs> I, 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 it's a good client. I like That's to good. talk yeah, about yeah, this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been married four different times. And he's gotten $20,000 four different times oh, wow. because the trust incentivizes the wrong thing, right? right? Like the, the parents wanted him to get married and they wanted to support the wedding and whatever else, but he figured out a way to get more money out of this trust quicker than he would have otherwise done it. <laughs> so we just need to be, as long as we're intentional about how we're putting in these uh, incentives, um, I think it's really can be really helpful and really meaningful. But when you start thinking about these specifics, it becomes much more important to think about all of the potential implications. Um, and so we just need to be really intentional as we do that. Uh, the other thing, uh, you know, as I get older, now that we've mentioned, you know, the estate tax long from long ago, yeah, yeah. Uh, 25, 30, and 35 is starting to sound a lot younger, right? Um, and so I've seen clients who have uh, inherited money at 25. And I've seen decisions that have been made by 25 year olds. I often tell my own story again, color commentary here. I'm sorry, Jason. Sure, go ahead. Um, but the, uh, you know, when I was 25, I'd been married for four years. I graduated law school. I had my MBA. I was working at my law firm. We had a small house in College Hill. Everything seemed great. Right. But if I had, if I had inherited money at 25, I would have turned around and paid off my student loan, which was at 1.9% interest. 
right? If I had invested that same amount of money over the next 10 years, I would have earned a ton more than 2% every year, right? So while seemingly reasonable, I was making poor, I would have been making poor decisions. And so that's what you really need to think about. And it becomes important to really, as James says, keep an eye on things over time. Because for me, I have a 10 and a 12 year old. I suffer a little bit from a lack of information. They seem great, but you know, the one that seemed great yesterday, today, apparently is having a pretty rough day. So, you know, 25 for her might not make any sense anymore, right? So we got to figure out over time as things change, how, what, uh, what the documents say and whether or not they're actually accomplishing the goals. So let's talk briefly about uh, a little bit deeper dive into creditor and divorce protection. Yep. Uh, when you think about your kids, depending on the age that they're in, maybe you have some experience with them and they are married and you're looking at that in-law and you're wondering if they're about to become an outlaw, right? And there's this fear that they may take a large portion of your estate with them if we're not careful. And there's ways we can structure that to protect those. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier those lifetime shares. As long as assets are held in trust, effectively by definition, they're separate assets, right? Because they're in this irrevocable at that point entity. Um, in most states that aren't community property states, as long as you keep property separate and your, your marriage ends, your divorcing spouse may not have a claim against that separate property. The way that we can ensure that property remain separate is by holding it in trust for some period of time. Um, and that's, you know, a lifetime share sounds pretty rigid, right? It sounds like, man, we worked all, all this time for this money. We want our kids to be able to enjoy it. Well, there are ways to make it less rigid. We can name your kid as the trustee of their share. So now your child is the gatekeeper, right? They're the ones managing the money. They're the ones deciding whether or not the discretionary standards perhaps are appropriate to exercise, right? So they can say, hey, look, I'm 40. My marriage is kind of eh, not real sure. I'm going to forego a distribution this year and see what happens. Or they can say, look, I'm 50. My kids are doing great. I'd really like them to have crazy weddings. So I'm going to take money out. And they're the ones that really are the ones making that decision in that way. So it's really about weighing uh, the the desire and the protective benefit of control versus the, the need and the desire for flexibility. And we, we try to manage that in these documents. We try to figure out how to give you as much control as you possibly can have, while at the same time allowing future generations to be able to adapt for things that we might not have anticipated. So one last thing before we move on to grandkids. <clears throat> um, I want to add into this conversation the idea that um, I have had so many discussions with clients that are afraid of their kids inheriting these resources. They're not ready, right? They've, they've never had this much money. They've never had the feeling of what it feels like to have extra. And so once they feel like they have extra, they're going to turn into lottery winners. And that terrifies me. And, and one of the answers for sure is restrictions and structure and all the things that we talked about. And that's great. The other answer, which I want you to consider, is actually getting them to a place where they have felt what it's like. So they get used to it. The problem with money, the hardest thing about money, 22 years of doing this, I can tell you the hardest thing by far is the having of it. That's it. It's hard to just let it sit there and not have your brain go to, oh, I can do this, I can I could buy that car, I could upgrade my house, I could but, 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 instantly go into all the things that your brain wants you to do rather than just letting it sit there. And the sooner you get your kids, and if you're going to skip to your grandkids, the sooner you get them access to the feeling of the having of it without doing anything with it, the better they're going to be prepared to then have it, right? But if we keep it away from them and then we dump it all on them at once, that's when they go buy the Porsche and the Ferrari and the, the, the everything, right? Because they've never had it before. And so they need to do something with it. So just to, as you're thinking about that, in my mind, that looks like making gifts giving intentional distributions of assets while they're while you're here and while they're here and then watching them totally screw it up, <laughs> right? They're going to make, you know, I had a, had a client that told me, well, if I give them $10,000, they're going to totally waste it. I'm like, yep, they will totally. And then you give them the next one and they'll probably waste that one too. And then you give them the next one. And eventually they'll have run through some of those trial and error things. They just got to get through. And the only way to get through it is to start giving it to them. If you wait until they you're gone, 
it's not staged out unless it's this super rigid structure. We want to actually start that experience now. And that's that part of living the legacy now and continuing it rather than having to start at death. All right. Let's talk about grandkids. I like them. Yeah, yeah. You don't have them yet. I don't so have that's them. That's good. Um, generally, I like them. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about generation skipping. Hmm. Uh, this is a great opportunity, but there's also something that you and I talked about that really kind of caught me a little bit off guard, which I enjoy. Uh, I'm a big fan where we can of saying we're going to go ahead and skip our next generation to the level that makes sense and give that to the grandkids. And one of the challenges that Jake pushed back on was go ahead, this idea that I am in a better position. That one? Is that what we're talking yes, about? Exactly. Yeah, okay, good. All right. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. Where are we at? Yeah, I was like, wait, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, one of the things you got to consider if you skip your kids for the benefit to benefit your grandkids, if it's a, a nominal amount, $5,000, $10,000, $25,000, something where it's a remembrance, it's completely fine. I'm good with that. Let's talk about it. Let's do it. But if there are significant amounts that you're going to send directly to your grandkids, either because you think your kids don't need it, or because you think your kids aren't in a position to use it well or whatever else. Effectively, what you're doing is you're substituting your judgment for how your grandkids should be cared for for your kids' judgment about how their kids should be cared for, right? And so as a dad of a 10 and a 12-year-old, uh, you know, if my in-laws or my mom gave money directly to my kids and skipped me, she probably doesn't know about the 529 plan that we've been funding, right? Or she doesn't know about the fact that we've been setting aside things for future uh, planning that now has kind of made it feel dumb, right? If I locked up money in a 529 plan for my kids to go to college, and now my mom skips me and gives them money because she wanted to provide for their college, of course. Well, now what do I do with this money in the 529 plan? I mean, James will have some ideas for that. But, <laughs> the, you know, you, you see how you could, you could substitute your judgment for your kids' judgment with respect to the grant. That may be fine. And there are reasons that we do that from time to time, but it is something that we need to carefully consider. Yeah, and I thought that was a really great observation. I think for me, I am, uh, I, I do encourage the idea of skipping generations when it's efficient. This is one of those scenarios right. where you can have your cake and eat it too, right. where you can do a generation skipping provision inside your trust that says, I'm gonna give the income to my kids. I'm going to create effectively a retirement cash flow stream for them, but the principal is not theirs. It's my grandkids. And so you're able to still take care of your kids and your grandkids. This is that whole two birds, okay. one stone That's thing. Right. And a lot of times we pick one or the other. And in that case, I definitely agree with Jake, this idea that pick your kids if you're picking one or the other. But if there's efficiencies you can gain through that generation skip, you can actually take care of both of them, which is pretty special. So you want to give a quick... Yeah, this is where you got to buckle up. That's, that's right. This, we're we're going to go... Yeah, this is the like second going. worst day of Wall Street. Generation <laughs> skipping transfer tax. So remember, two types of tax, right? There's income tax, there's transfer tax. Transfer tax is a tax on transfers of assets. The ones that we mostly focus on are the gift and the estate tax, right? There's an exemption from the gift and the estate tax for your lifetime. And it's actually, they just announced two days ago that it's going to go up to $12.92 million. So right now it's... $12,060,000 for each individual. Next year, it'll be $12,920,000. If you're married, you can claim your spouse's exemption. So effectively, you'll be able to pass $25 million free of gift or estate tax. So you can give away $25 million while you're living or upon your death before we pay the gift or the estate tax. And that thing where the spouse can, you know, utilize the other spouse's exemption amount, that's called portability. It means that you can port effectively the exemption from one to the other. The generation skipping transfer tax exemption is also equal to 12.92 million next year, 12 million, 60,000 this year, but it's not portable. So it's unique to each spouse. So if you don't do an appropriate amount of planning, you may only be able to shield 12 million, 60,000 dollars from the GST tax uh, without realizing that you're not utilizing the other spouse's exemption. So it's really important to kind of pay attention to it because the transfer tax is applied first, the gift or the estate tax is 40%. So if you had a million dollars that's subject to the gift or the estate tax, 400,000 of that would be paid in tax, right? After that's calculated, then they apply the generation skipping transfer tax, which is another 40%. So now you're down to $360,000 of your million that actually gives to your grandkids. 
if it's subject to this test. So we really like to avoid it. Uh, it is a little complicated because you got to figure out whether the tax is going to apply or not. With these lifetime shares uh, that we've kind of been alluding to, there is a way where you can protect the principal and make it so that, that those dollars are not includable in your kid's estate. Let's talk about a potential client who has uh, really successful children and they have 10 million of their own dollars and you have 10 million of your dollars and now you're thinking about where that's gonna go, right? Well, let's say you have a daughter who's not married and she's worth $10 million and you're gonna leave her $5 million. Well, immediately you've subjected $3 million potentially to estate tax, right? So the exemption's roughly 12. She's already got 10, you've given her five. 15 minus 12 is three. I did it. Good, good. Yeah, it's yeah, good. That's right. Uh, so you got that $3 million. You're not as complicated as I thought. I know, right? It's, it's tough for me. I thought, you know. Uh, so $1.2 million is going to pay the, the government on that in that example, right? However, if you hold that $5 million in trust for uh, this daughter's benefit during her lifetime, pursuant to certain distribution provisions, uh, then those assets are not includable in her estate. So when she passes away, that $5 million plus all of the appreciation on those underlying assets are excluded for purposes of estate tax from her estate and can pass to her children free of not only the estate tax, but also the generation skip and transfer tax. Yep. There are some eyes that have glazed over, but not all of them. I mean, so it's, I feel like you I, got, you know, I, I, I was about to jump in and rescue yeah, everybody. No, so I know. It's, it's, no. Yeah, it's, it's, to me, there's a couple it, yeah. of scenarios where that starts to really make sense. One for sure in a scenario where you're over those exemption limits. Yep. Another is when you're, you have a really different situation with your kids, which never happens, right? They're always <laughs> the same. No, uh, you've got a scenario where one of those uh, generations, one of those children has a wildly high net worth and you're just dumping onto a tax problem that they already are gonna face. And so you're making their situation worse if you don't do this transfer, this generation skip because you're just gonna pay tax and then it's gonna get taxed again and then it's gonna get taxed again. And at least we can skip one of those levels, right? Um, the other thing that I see a lot of times is a scenario where you have a, uh, you can do a limited- uh, Power of appointment. You, well, no, I'm oh, not going sorry. there yet. But sorry. You can do a, a an income stream to one of your one of your kids that doesn't have kids, doesn't have a spouse, they're totally single, that's going to be their plan, they're never going to have any of those things. You know, we could give them all the income off these assets, but then pull those assets back to the rest of your bloodline, right. to make sure that it doesn't just go to who knows where, right, we can actually control for that and give them the benefit of those assets while they're alive, but skip their generation to go to back to other grandkids that may not be their own kids. And that's, a, right. that's okay, right? We're just trying to make sure that in those, lit, as we're following the money, it's actually going where we want it to go. And we have some direction for that rather than kind of hoping for the best. Just no strings attached, good luck. We see those kinds of mismatches. We want to make sure we put some of that structure in place to pull it back. What were you going to say about one of the power of Well, one of the ways to build in the flexibility in these lifetime shares, because if you think about what we're doing, let's say today we, we execute one of these trusts that we're going to hold for your kid's lifetime. Maybe your kid's 40. Uh, so we could be holding this trust potentially for you know, 50 years, right? Well, 50 years from now, it's kind of hard to anticipate what's going to be going on, right? So one of the things that we can do is we can give your children what's called a limited power of appointment. So it gives them the right to appoint the trust assets that you held for their benefit during their lifetime to whoever you've defined that they can appoint it to. Usually that ends up being your issue, meaning your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren, et cetera. So their siblings, nieces, nephews, or charity, um, or some other realm of people. But by limiting it, we can give your kids that uh, flexibility, but we're still not including it in their estate for estate tax purposes. The alternative is a general power of appointment. And if anyone is a holder of a general power of appointment, then those assets become includable in the estate. So we want to avoid that. But it's a way to balance kind of the um, uh, ability to provide, but then also to account for things that we may not be able to anticipate as we sit here today. One thing about grandkids that's worth noting that you can do while you're alive is pay for college education, right? So uh, one of the things that we lose sight a lot of times around is this unlimited deduction. You want to talk a little bit about yeah, so any medical expenses or ed educational expenses, if you pay them directly on behalf of someone, there's an unlimited gifting deduction for that. 
So it's not a taxable gift. You can pay $5 million worth of educational expenses for people. As long as you pay it directly to the educational institution, you don't give it to the people, uh, then it's not subject to the gift tax. Um, so that's a good way to kind of think through how you can um, uh, further some of your kids um, and grandkids' educational opportunities or medical needs if they have them. Uh, interesting to note, when that exemption from the estate tax went up a couple of days ago, also the annual exclusion, which is the amount that you're allowed to give every year, free of the gift tax, this year it's 16,000, went up to 17,000. So next year you can give $17,000 per person to any person. So one, I could give you know, my daughter and her future husband $34,000, right, in, a, in any given year, uh, and not be subject to any gift tax. And that doesn't reduce my lifetime exception. So, yep. so one thing to keep in mind is rather, so when it comes to grandkids, uh, if, you, if you have kids that have you know, judgment that you trust, give the assets to them if they're gonna be passing that down. Let them decide how your grandkids will be impacted by that within reason. If you don't trust their judgment, then you can do some of the generation skipping. You can kind of, give them the benefit, but make sure you skip them in terms of the control. And uh, don't wait until you've passed away to make the benefit to your grandkids. Do that while you're alive. Pay for their college education, pay for any level of education, pay for their medical expenses right. if they have them. You should be the source of those things if you're trying to ultimately impact them. Do that from your resources rather than your kids and then backfill in that, right? Because then they're subject to maybe another transfer tax. One of the challenges around all these numbers that Jake's thrown around, $12.9 million, it's a big stinking number, is it currently is set yeah. to go away. Right. So in 2026, yep. that law sunsets, and we go from almost $13 million back to six and some change, right? Yeah, six and a half. Six and a half million. Yep. So right now you can pass 13 million each, and in 2026, you can pass 13 million total, yep. right? So it's, a, it's who knows what's gonna happen. If I'm a betting man, I would bet that we won't know until the 11th hour right before it changes, right? Like, you know, Congress won't get to it. Generally happens. Yes, exactly. It'll be a panic attack. Um, all right, let's talk about charity. So when we think about assets going to charity, uh, a, a lot of times we see this being part of the estate plan. And I, I love that. It's great. I have to tell you, I'm not a huge fan of estate distributions straight to charity for a couple of reasons. One, the charity probably could have used that a little bit earlier along the way. And two, you get basically no benefit from that whatsoever. So just kind of waiting until you know for sure you don't need it anymore and then giving it then doesn't really benefit anybody. It does certainly benefit the charity, but to the degree that we can pull some of that back into your lifetime, you actually get to take things like tax deductions, which are great. We get to reduce how much is going to the government. You also get to be connected to those causes, be rubbing elbows with the leaders and making decisions with them, helping them, helping influence how those resources are being used. And so I generally recommend that we don't just give all of our charitable deductions at the end of the year, or I'm sorry, at the end of life. My recommendation is that we pull some of that into your current experience and get some of those tax benefits along the way. Uh, one of the best ways to do that is this thing called a donor advised fund. Uh, that is, in my opinion, a part of the estate plan. It's a really important part because it's the part that starts to establish your legacy now. So if you start giving assets to that donor advised fund today, you can start to welcome your grandkids into that conversation, welcome your kids into that conversation. You may be able to say to them, hey, you each have $5,000 to give to something that matters to you. Where do you want to give it? Right? Start getting them into that story. And then when you pass away, the donor advised fund can be the beneficiary of some of that charitable giving. And then your kids and grandkids can then continue that vision. The legacy actually is a continuation that way, rather than you dumping money into a charity that they weren't involved in, that they have no control over. And they go, why did money go there, right? You can actually start to set them up to be part of that with you and then carry out giving those resources away. It also, quite frankly, sets them up to be rubbing elbows with really influential people. If your kid or grandkid is walking into a banquet where there are people writing $500,000 checks and they're in the conversation, it's, those are interesting and amazingly influential people to know, right? And so we wanna give them access to some of those conversations and be in the space where people are moving and making an impact. They wanna be in that discussion. This is a ticket that gets them in, right? They've got 
let's say a, a million dollar donor advised fund that they're in charge of, they walk into that room, they're gonna be talking to everybody in that room about what we're up to, how can we help? How do we solve hunger? How do we solve you know, poverty? Whatever they're passionate about, but they're talking to the people leading that effort rather than you know, throwing 50 bucks at it and hoping for the best. That is a very different outcome for them than just getting them minimally involved in charity. Okay, here's how we actually get to the benefit where we get to do all these things at once. Charity is an incredible tool. Donor advice fund is an amazing tool, but when we couple it with the rest of the design of the estate plan, it actually becomes superpower. We get to do all the things. So one way that we do that is a thing called a charitable remainder trust, where we say, we're gonna give money to this trust and whatever's left at our death goes to charity. But while we're alive, we get income off of it. Maybe you say our kids get income off of it. You can set it up so that cash flow is coming back to people that you want to have cash flow come to, but then at death, it's a charitable contribution. So you want to start add color to Yeah, that. no, you did a great job. Thank you. That was uh, really good. I feel like that was more play-by-play. -play. That's true. You know, Dang it, you're right. All right. But no, it's great. Uh, and with the charitable remainder trust, you get a current income tax deduction when you fund it at the beginning. So you put money into it, you get a tax deduction, and then every year, money is paid out to you or your kids or whoever we set it up. We have to make sure that it works out from a, a computation standpoint because it can't, it has to work out so that there's money left to go to the charity in theory. Um, and so we calculate that all out at the beginning. But ultimately, when whatever time frame passes, then the money goes to charity and whatever's left gets to those, um, those beneficiaries. And if, it is the, if that charity is your donor advised fund, then the people that you've named as your successor advisors are the people who get to figure out how that money is distributed. And so it really can be a pretty great uh, coupling of a couple different techniques uh, here. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can use the money that is being paid from the, uh, the charitable remainder trust to fund uh, the purchase of a life insurance policy. And then you can replace effectively the money that you've given away to the charitable remainder trust with the, the death benefit of the proceeds of that life insurance. If we hold that life insurance and in what's called an irrevocable life insurance trust, like an IRA, um, that won't be includable in your estate. So we can effectively transfer dollars that would have been includable in your estate to ultimately benefit charity and use the income stream produced by those dollars to then purchase a policy it replaces all of those dollars, but it won't be taxable now. That kind of makes sense. Oh, oh man, yeah, this right? is this is where like that's where a three I, birds one stone. I know that's where thing, we really right? get into the. Not only do you get to <laughs> give to the charity, create the cash flow to buy the life insurance policy that then makes your kids or grandkids whole in an islet that's outside of your estate. You also get a tax deduction for doing that. Right. It's insane, right? So that is a really complicated layer of all these different moving parts, but it gives you a sense of if charity is part of the design, then let's not just give it when we die and just, you know, let's actually do some things that will make a huge impact. We get a tax deduction now, we get to replace this assets that would otherwise be taxed and put them into a tax-free vehicle that then actually passes both estate and income tax-free. And we get a a deduction for putting it all together. So the only one we're cheating out of the deal, out of those four, is the government. That's right. That's the one we want to cheat. Man. We're not That's cheating. We we're not cheating. You're right. We're avoiding. Well, thank you for avoiding. the correction. That is yeah. the legal tax mind avoidance right there. Yes. is well perfectly done. legal. Yeah. Perfectly legal. Tax yeah. evasion, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, but one well, other exactly one other great tool is a qualified charitable distribution. Lots of us have saved uh, meticulously in our uh, qualified plans, IRAs, 401ks, those sorts of things. Uh, after you turn 70 and a half, you can distribute up to $100,000 each year directly to charity from your qualified plan. Uh, the benefit of doing that is if you had taken that $100,000 out, um, you would experience $100,000 worth of income. You would then turn around and get a $100,000 deduction, but your gross income on your tax return would be $100,000 higher than what you actually experience, right? If you send it directly to charity, you don't get the deduction but that $100,000 never shows up on your tax return, which can ultimately help reduce your overall uh, tax brackets. So that's a good way to handle it too, during your life. Yes. And we wouldn't necessarily wanna wait until death for that because you can't really do it at death. Um, and it doesn't benefit you then anyway. Um, but qualified plan dollars are always the best dollars to be thinking about uh, when we're not always the best 
most times the best dollars to be thinking about when we're trying to figure out how we're going to fund some of these charitable distributions. So it's important to keep in mind. Do you want to get into the testimony? I'm ready for that before oh, I do. Man. So we're going to get into one that is super weedy and really exciting. Uh, but before I do, I, I realize we, yeah, we just fill the air. We talk. We, so we joked do. about the fact that there's never a microphone that we don't want to talk into. So let's stop for a second and see, are there any questions, any check-ins, any like, uh, what, how does that work again? Or anything that we want, you need clarification on before we move on. Yeah. Ask into the microphone so the Zoom can hear. Sorry, the Zoomers. For the lifetime gift tax. Yep. yep. You got 12.9 12, 12 million right now, yep. but it's only 17,000 a year starting next year. Yep. 17,000 a year in addition. Oh, on top of that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. My question is, if it's a lifetime gift tax, how is that tracked? So when you, if you give your five-year-old a five hundred dollars, yep. and your twenty-one-year-old a thousand, I mean, how is that calculated throughout a lifetime? And and yep. is there something you're supposed to do, or what? what is that, how is that? Or even you go to give someone twenty thousand dollars this year. Yep. How does that work? So if the amount that you're giving in any given year is less than the question. annual exclusion, so this year the sixteen thousand, as long as that amount in any given year is less than that, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to track it, you don't have to file anything, you just, you just give it away. As long as it's less than $16,000 per individual, right? Or per, 30, per, per, per giver and yes, per and receiver. So the right. thing to keep in mind is, if you're married, you can give 32,000 to any individual person. Right, right, that's right. Uh, if that, the gift is more than that, then you gotta file a gift tax return, IRS form 709, uh, so you file the gift tax return every year that you make taxable gifts. You don't pay any tax because ultimately you have this credit that excludes up to the 13 million next year from the tax. So you don't pay the tax, but that's how you report what your gifts have been so that the IRS knows, hey, you don't have 13 million anymore. Now you only have 12, now you only have 10, right? So that's the idea. Now, what's gonna happen in 2025 if nothing else happens? is that everybody is going to figure out or try to figure out how they're going to be able to utilize the amount of their exemption that's over what it will be when it goes back down to six and a half million, right? So we're gonna figure out how to use that six and a half million that we're gonna lose in 2026. And so in those years, people are gonna make big gifts, probably to irrevocable trusts in some form or another uh, to try to preserve that amount before it goes away. So some folks did it a couple of years ago because they threatened to lower the amount. And now each year they give more because it's indexed for inflation and it hasn't yet gone down. So they keep trying to take bites at that apple, which you can do. Uh, you just gotta be intentional about how you do it. Very helpful, thank you. Yeah, thank yep. you. Yep. What other questions so far? Yeah, Joy's got a mic right there. Yeah. Now, I'm just curious, uh, I wanna use a reality number like $20,000. Uh -huh. uh, with the idea that you're going to give it to charity, is there any difference whether you take it directly out of the fund or you took it out of your RMD? The is fund, the fund meaning uh, like I, a brokerage an account that, that's okay. not an IRA. Is that what you're saying? Is it in an no, IRA? I'm just saying if I got an IRA. Okay, so it's all in an IRA. Right. Yep. But and I also take it if you have to do an RMD. Yep, that's right. Does it make any difference whether I take it out of the IRA or I take it out of the RMD? Well, that is the same thing. So if you're sending a qualified charitable distribution from your IRA, you're using your RMD. That's the way to think of it. Yep, that's a great question. So yeah, $10,000 check goes out of your IRA to a charity, then you only have 10,000 left on your $20,000 RMD. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he's got you, he's coming, yep. Um, yeah, my question is regarding if, uh, let's say a child, inherits insurance money. Yep. How is that treated? I mean, obviously the initial payment is uh, not taxable right. because it's insurance. But the rest of the lifetime, is, is that, does that come into the picture at all or is that it? That money is yep. theirs to do with it, whatever they want to do with it. That it's, it's more like the latter. If they inherited money from the insurance policy, it's now in their estate. And so from there on out, if it grows, if there's tax on the interest or, or dividends that are being paid, they're paying those taxes themselves. Okay. Unless see. that is actually given instead of given to them, it's given to a trust for their benefit, then the trust might be paying those taxes. But if they're getting the proceeds, it's just as if you wrote them a check. But 
but if they get, you know, from that money, yep. and that is actually, yeah. yeah, yes, if they if they inherit the money and then they give it away, yeah. now they're subject to what they're allowed to give, because right. it's now their money, it's in their estate, and now if they give it to their their kids, for example, okay. it's part of their gift. Yep. Okay. Great question. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Keith. Great presentation, guys. Um, based on your experience, any words of wisdom on how to choose the right trustee for all these trusts you've been talking about? Carefully. Carefully. That's the, no, carefully. That's it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's two. Well, kind thanks of, for coming, everybody. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> I haven't said it depends yet. That's so, right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. That's good. Um, two ends of the spectrum, right? Individual trustees and then corporate trustees. Uh, and then there can be something in between. And so with individual trustees, you're using an individual person. That might be your kids. It might be uh, a good friend, an advisor. I mean, obviously, any time that that trustee who's an individual is in your same generation, there's the risk that they may not be there, especially if we're holding shares for some decent amount of time. So you got to consider what you're trying to accomplish because depending on what you're trying to do, you're, you're probably going to be on one end or the other of the spectrum. The middle ground is to have a co-trustee where you have maybe an individual who serves with a corporate trustee. And when I say corporate trustee, I mean a bank or a trust company. Um, there are different organizations that serve in a capacity as trustee, that's what they do. Um, and so ultimately the benefit of the corporate side is that they're gonna be there forever. And if they're not there, they'll have a successor. So that's easy, um, but it's harder to deal with the corporate trustee, right? They're not flexible. Sometimes, depending on which one you're dealing with, you're calling a 1-800 number. You're talking to somebody in Michigan. And the next time you call, you're talking to somebody in California. And you're never talking to the same people, right? Um, so that can be difficult. But depending on what we're trying to accomplish, whether it's if we really want to strictly protect these assets for the benefit of your kids, well, then a corporate trustee might make sense. If really all we're doing is trying to shield these assets from some of the tax and put the parameters in place so that your kids have an idea of what they should be doing, then potentially your kids can be a good option. So really, I mean, this is where it depends comes in. Yep. Uh, it I was does. Gonna, I, I yeah. was going to stop you right. Yeah. Before. Right. Uh, yeah. It depends. Yeah, yeah. It, it really does depend. Uh, but it what it depends on is what you're trying to accomplish through the trust, and then really the time horizon over which that's going to be accomplished. Does and that to, make sense? and to add to that, one of the things that I think is really important that we are big fans of is doing a family fire drill. Yeah. So if your kids are playing a role in any aspect of your estate get them all in the same room. We tend to not talk about money. It's taboo. It's scary. It's, you know, we've not talked about it our entire life as a family. And now all of a sudden we're talking about it. That gets really weird. We do that kind of stuff all the time where we'll have a family come in and everybody sits around the table and we say, okay, Sally, you're the trustee. And here's what that means. Here's what you're going to have to do. Here's what you need to know. And Billy, you're the power of attorney. Here's what that means if they're different, right? So we're walking them through how this all works. And you run a fire drill to say at mom and dad's death, this is what's going to happen because they're all scared of it. And it's a really awkward conversation to have, but you need to have it. You got to get them ready. And so that's a huge, huge advantage. Let's, let's move on real quick. We'll come back to questions, but this is the ultimate example. It's going to get, you got to follow me here. Yeah, this is the ultimate tough. example of being able to do everything at once, like everything all at once at the same time. Here we go. So right now, when you leave an IRA behind to the next generation, under the current law, they have 10 years to get that money out, right? So if you leave a traditional IRA, they, it used to be they could stretch it out of their, over their lifetime. That's no longer the case. Now they have 10 years. And so there's different schools of thought on whether you stage that out over 10 years, whether you let it compound and then have a giant tax bomb at the end. We fall on different sides of the camp. Every CFP that you line up will tell you a different answer to that. But the bottom line is no matter how you pull it out in 10 years, it's got to come all the way out of the IRA completely, which means the tax bill is going to be large for that inherited IRA. And Especially ultimately, your kids are going to get all the money. At some and the point. kids get all the money. Yeah. That's right. So a way to avoid that and to extend the life of that distribution that is relatively new is you can name a testamentary charitable remainder trust as your beneficiary. So you can say, I'm going to take this million dollar IRA and rather than giving it to my kids, I'm going to put it into a charitable remainder trust for the benefit. The income beneficiary is my kid. Now, the beautiful thing is a charitable remainder trust will pay them income for the rest of their life. So we got out of the 10 year deal, right? Now they get the income for the rest of their life. If you want to really get fun, 
you name the remainder beneficiary of that asset your donor advice fund. And then you give your grandkids the responsibility to give money to that. Now we've benefited the charity, we've benefited our kids with income, and then we've gotten our grandkids involved in how to give it away. It's their turn. I think that's the coolest thing we've ever thought of. Jake came up with it. So I have to tell you. I mean, I well read done, an well article. Done, Jake, well I read done. an article that you. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good article, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. So how would, how would you add to that? Oh, that's right. I mean, that's exactly uh, the benefit there. I mean, it's in 2020, uh, the SECURE Act is what changed the rules about the distributions from the IRAs. Right now, the Congress is debating the SECURE Act 2.0, so we might have some additional updates that we find out about um, here later. But uh, ultimately, the change was that if you're a non-spouse beneficiary, and if you're a beneficiary that's over 18, you got to take it out over 10 years as opposed to over your lifetime, this is a perfect way uh, to effectively get closer to what a lifetime distribution uh, of the RMDs uh, would look like. And remember, your kids are only taxed on what comes out of the charitable remainder trust. So if a million dollars goes into the uh, IRA or into the charitable remainder trust, a million dollars goes in, say the payout is 5% 5 a year, uh, your kids get the $50,000 each year, they're taxed on the $50,000 uh, and that's it. The rest of the money continues to grow tax-free, you know, don't pay any tax on that yeah. while it's in the charitable remainder trust. So it can be really, it's a, it's a nice way to kind of blend a lot of what we've talked about. And if that million dollars spits off that income for the kid's lifetime and stays a million dollars, right. then at the kid's death, that million dollars goes into the donor advised fund and the grandkids are now rubbing elbows right. with the people who are trying to make an impact on the causes they care about. And they got a million dollars to give to those causes. So the only one that gets... Evaded. Not evaded either. That's yeah. right. No, yeah. Not now, the only one that gets cut out of that deal is the forced distribution that spikes the tax return or the tax rate over that 10 years. That's right. The kids are still paying income tax on what they're getting from the charitable remainder trust. There's still money going to the government, but it's not as dramatic and it's not forcing it. And it's also controlling that distribution so your kids aren't just blowing it. Right. So super cool. That, that's the way we want to be thinking about it. And that is in that advanced estate world. It's not either or right kids or charity. It's we can do all of this stuff. We can mix these things in ways that accomplish all of what you're trying to do at the same time and make it really efficient. To do it. So that's the idea. Any questions that we have not yet? Yes. Pete. Uh, Coming at you. Before you talk about wanting to give to charity now rather than when you die. Yes. Yeah. The last concept, it puts the money to the charity way down the road. Yes, that's right. That is correct. That, that is, is correct. correct. Okay. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So the mix there is give to charity with your required minimum distributions while you're alive, right? Be doing charitable contributions, but this is a way to stretch out that distribution for your kids' benefit and then give your grandkids the money. So it is a big delay. So I don't want this to be the only thing you do, right? <laughs> Uh, do charitable work while you're here, but this is a really cool way to do it. Yeah. So, yeah. Other questions? No. Great uh, concepts. A lot of a lot of creative things I've not heard before. So thanks so much. Is there a is there a minimum estate value or net worth before you really start considering some of these things? I would say, depending, I mean, it, there's no minimum value to be intentional about how you're going to leave these assets to your beneficiary. So no matter how much you have, um, I'm not necessarily ever concerned about the, the actual value. It's more about making sure we're accomplishing the goals, right? And making sure that we're doing what it is you want to be intentional about doing. So no, but some of these things, when we start talking about estate tax, I mean, unless you're at the $6 million um, Round about that level, estate tax isn't going to be coming into play really ever. We don't think it should, but right now there's no plan that it will. And so, really, when you're when we're talking about more of the estate tax avoidance and the planning with respect to the generation skipping transfer tax and those sorts of things, we're really looking at someone in the six to twelve million dollar range. And we want to talk about those options together. Um, what James alluded to at the very beginning is that's a big change because when we first started out, I mean, you had $338,333, you could be subject to a higher estate tax. Um, so it's, the numbers are much larger now. So the idea of the complicated planning, um, you know, it's 
much less prevalent, but it's not necessarily only driven by the tax avoidance because some of the other things in terms of the meaningful legacy piece uh, is, a, is achieved through these things. Make sense? Yeah, I would, I would agree. I think a lot of times I think people make decisions on their estate design because of taxes. That's their primary motivator. And I think that is a terrible motivation for how to build a legacy, right? If we're thinking about wanting to impact the causes we care about in our, the family that we love, and the only thing we're really paying attention to is what's going to the government, we're going to miss all of the point. So it doesn't matter what goes to the government. What matters is are we accomplishing what we want for the kids and grandkids and beyond. At the same time, if we can also avoid tax, that's great. But one thing that everybody is subject to is income tax. So a lot of times when we're talking about taxation at the estate level, we're talking about transfer tax, gift tax, estate tax. There's also income tax. And income tax is you know, guaranteed, right? And so there are ways that when you're doing these things like the charitable contributions and you're avoiding income tax, whether it's a charitable remainder trust that you're giving now, you get a deduction today, right? We're getting income tax benefits. So a lot of times the, the strategies don't necessarily have a minimum. They have more of a focus on what are we trying to accomplish on the back end and how can we make it the most efficient in all taxation, not just transfer. Right. And one of the big things to keep in mind there too is... Uh, if you give assets away to individuals, the donee inherits or gets the basis of the donor, right? So if you, basis is the concept of if you buy a share of stock for $10, it appreciates to 100, your basis is the $10 that you paid. If you sell it for 100, that difference is the capital gain, right? And so if you hold it for over a year, it's a long-term capital gain. Uh, that's the uh, other side of the tax, the income tax side. And so if you die owning, a share of stock, your beneficiaries get a step up in basis to the date of death value. So if you, I mean, in Cincinnati, we talk about PNG stock all the time, right? So the PNG stock that you got for $10, that's now worth 100. If you die owning that stock and you give it to your daughter, she inherits that share of stock with a basis of $100. If she then turns around and sells it for $100, there's no gain. Yeah, that's what was that? Oh Unless yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. That's fair. Yeah, that's a fair yeah. point. That's right. Yes, that doesn't get the step up. Yeah. 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 I was. Yeah. It's a good qualifying point. Yes. Thank you. Yes. We have a question from one yeah. of the folks at home. So my wife and I aren't yet sure how much we'll have when we retire, and how much we'll need for ourselves. Can you talk about strategies that allow some take back if things don't work out as well as we hoped? How do we cover ourselves for uncertainty, but still develop this legacy if things work out well? Uh, that's a great question. Really good one. Go, Go ahead. Take that Go one. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is actually a big part of what we do is creating as, as, as good of an educated guess as we can on what the future holds and where things are going to go. And clearly, all of those numbers are wrong, but they're close, right? We're getting as far, as close as we can to what we should expect in our future. And so what I would argue is if you have a really confident plan, if the plan is really strong, if you're doing all the things that you said you needed to do, you're saving the way you said you would save, you're paying your debt the way you said you would pay, over time, we can have a lot of confidence that you will get to a place where that, I, I've been, for 22 years, we've lived through so many stinking bear markets. Every time it's the end of the world and every time it's not. But we keep doing this pattern. And what I find as I look over those 22 years is the, if I ran a plan 22 years ago, I'm pretty much dead on where I said I was going to be. I mean, it finds its way. And so if we can have a really clear, compelling vision of where we're going and we've mapped it out really well, then you can start to put some of these in layers. There's always got to be fail safes. And one of the ways that we can do fail safes is we can put them in structures that trigger and you know, basically on the event of a death or things like that, that's why these things exist is so that you can have the confidence that at death, some of these things go live rather than putting them in today. Charity being the only part I would have should happen while you're alive. Well, and that's why I think the donor advised fund is so important because there you can manage, and you can figure out, hey, this is a really tough year. Yeah. Maybe this year I'm not gonna contribute as much as I might have in years past. Uh, or this is a great year, I'm gonna contribute more and I'm not going to necessarily distribute it at all so that if I have a bad year next year, I have money left in the fund that I can still be distributing, right? So that's one way to do it. What we've talked about a lot today, though, are irrevocable trusts. 
by their very nature, irrevocable trust, we shouldn't ever think that they're going to be changed. There are ways that we can change them. But ultimately, um, you know, a lot of this is kind of, we got to go in knowing the whole picture because we don't want to do any of these things in a vacuum because if we, you know, guess wrong or things change, it is hard to undo some of these techniques. Um, but what we're always trying to do is put in as much flexibility as we can while getting the benefit uh, that we're trying to achieve whether that's tax avoidance, whether that's control for kids, whatever it is, we wanna build in fail safes along the way. And we do that in the documents. Um, but you know, there is some, there, it's a limit. There's a limit to how much flexibility we can retain. Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, yep, go ahead. We are, we are close to time. So we'll take these last two questions. Go Just ahead. a real quick question. Yeah. I have a donor advised fund. Yeah, Okay. congrats. And it's about to be spent out. Yeah. Should yeah. I look at re-upping it or, you know, yeah. are you guys helping with that? Absolutely. That's what we do. Uh, one of the things that donor advice funds allow us to do is bunch contributions. So you can drop in three or four years worth of contributions in one year, take the deduction, and then take the standard deduction for three or four years in a row. So and do another bunch. Get with Dan. Right? Yeah, so get with Dan. Exactly right. right. So if you have been giving to a donor advice fund in a kind of a every few year kind of model, and you're draining it, that's exactly what you should be doing. That's exactly how that should work. Because I, what I don't want to do is I don't want you to give a bunch of money to a donor advice fund and let it sit there forever. That's not charity. Yeah. That's just hoarding money and taking a tax deduction for it. And I don't like that. I'm, I'm anti that. If you're going to give it away, give it away. But do it with those strat, uh, strategies in place to make sure you're taking those actions. Yeah, Dan. So this has always been with regards to financial assets. What about families that may have non-financial assets? maybe sports collections, memorabilia that could yeah. be worth a lot yeah. um, that yeah. have been inherited. I mean, how would that factor into what you've been talking about? Yeah. It would. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I mean, those are, those are the unique things where, I mean, we got to be really intentional about what we're trying to do. Right. I mean, we have to figure like the, the sports collections, we had a guy one time who came into our office with a, a gun container Oh, we're all kind of scary. Yeah, we're like, whoa, buddy. Yeah. And he opened it up and it was a sign. Whatever I did, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. Yeah. He, it was a, a signed Babe Ruth baseball bat that he wow. kept in this thing. It was great. And so we had to figure out what we needed to do. And so in his case, uh, we ended up donating it to charity uh, and it was auctioned off by the charity and raised a ton of money for the charity. So there are options, um, but it depends, you know, a little bit on the character of the asset because some of the things you can retain certain interests in the property. And then at the end of a certain amount of time, either it go to charity, it go to other people. Um, you know, you can have, you can split up the beneficial enjoyment as it were. So I don't know, they do fit in. It kind of, it's hard to speak specifically uh, about how without knowing exactly what, what it is. Well, yeah, and right. some of those things, even though they're not the traditional financial assets, they are assets That's right. and they absolutely can be held in, right. in structures. So we can yeah. put collections inside the trust and have it be part of the, the, the and one of the really nerdy things we didn't talk about oh man valuation discounts so one of the things that yeah right uh so one of the things that you could do is you could contribute that big collection to an, a limited liability company and give away interest in that limited liability company because those interests aren't marketable there's not a stock exchange for llc interest and because they might not have control based on how we deal with the operating agreement, you can adjust the value for purpose of its valuation. So it might be a million dollars worth of stuff that you put in this LLC. If you give away 20% of it, that 20% might not be worth $200,000, right? It might be worth 60% of the $200,000, 75%. So anyway, that's for enough, That's like 501 and change. Yeah, yeah. man. We'll come back but that is, one, that is one of those things that uh, every time you hear about changes to the estate tax law, there are two main tools that we use, grantor trusts and valuation discount. Uh, those are the two things that Congress kind of has its eye on that may go away. Uh, they were slated to go away here a couple of years ago and they didn't. So it's likely that if there is some type of overhaul of the transfer tax scheme, those things might be a thing of the past. Then the collection would be taxed. Yeah. There's one thing I know for sure it's gonna change. Yeah, that's right, it uh, will change. Job security. No, that's, yeah, right. that's right. That's right. I look back. I mean, all the this is not a political statement at all, <laughs> at all. Hear me very clearly. But all the rigmarole and anger and fear and 
yuck that's out there. In 22 years, I look back and I was like, so what's actually, what's actually changed in 20 years? And over the course of that time, the effective tax rate of the highest earners has changed by about four and a half, five percent And over that time, the effective tax rate of the average earner has changed by about 1%. And yet we keep acting like we're moving the ball in just really dramatic ways. And it always changes things. It always makes a big mess for all of us to fix. You know, every time they change the rules, it's like, well, what does that mean? We have to rearrange it all. But at the end, it's actually kind of been pretty much the same. <laughs> so uh, I don't think any of you are probably all that surprised that Congress actually hasn't changed that much yeah, in the last right. 22 years, even though they yell at each other a lot. Uh, but that's been really, really significant. So we will see change. I don't think it will actually change. Right. Right. All right. We're still here. Happy to answer any other questions that you have. But thank you so much for coming. Thanks for being part of the thing on Zoom. And it's just fun to see this room full. So thanks for being here. All right. Thank thanks, you. Guys. Thanks, James. Thank I you. did want to ask everyone if you would please um, give us your thoughts. We have response cards at your places. And we'd like to make this better and keep listening to what you think of this presentation. Thank you, James. It's always a pleasure to hear from your wisdom and insight. Thank you, Jake. You are a good man and so good at what you do. And thank you for being our referral Atticus Finch. So, and good for you if you got that reference. It's, if you didn't, it's worth a Google and a trip to the library. Oh, and friends at Zoom, you can email your advisor or me if you have any comments too. Thank you. <laughs>